Hi everybody, we are live here in the aquarium today. Today marks the fifth anniversary of the reopening of the aquarium. So we wanted to bring you guys some of the world beneath the waves today and answer all of your aquarium and fish related questions. As we've been doing, we're gonna give you a little bit of time to get in here and join us. Uh, give us a shout out when you're in and can hear us and can see us. We'll make sure everything's working and we're good to go. And we'll start today with a few little shout outs to you guys, say hi, and wait as we build our audience a little bit. All right, so again, this is the fifth anniversary of the aquarium reopening. Good morning, Marley and Rossford. Hi, Mike. Hi, Andrew. Good to see you. Hi, Ashley. Ryan, it has been five years already. It seems like it was just yesterday when we started in here and seeing all of the new things and enjoying this new aquarium. Hi, Dinah and Lima. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We will start taking your questions momentarily here. Uh, good morning, Miles, Simone, and Juliana. Hi, Drake. Good morning, Kimmy. Hi, Breland, Braxton, and Bailey. Hi, Mom. Always got to get that out there, too. Hi, Erica. Well, we're glad we could be in your favorite part of the part of the zoo today. Hi, Paige, Hunter, and Nora. Hi, Jane and Maryland. Hi, Austin and Alicia. Hi, Gibson. Hi, Farron. Hi, Ariel. Good morning, Sophia. I can. Hi, Athena and Caden. Hi, Peyton. Peyton loves fish. That's awesome. This is your day then, Peyton. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a few announcements for you. Um, we are continuing our Meals on the Go next week, so if you missed out on the enchiladas and pasta Tuesday and Thursday of this week, we've got new entree options for you next week, beef stew and hot turkey. Go to ToledoZoo.org and check out Meals on the Go to place your order. It's super simple. You order and pay online, then drive to the Broadway gate and we'll bring it right out to your car. Feeds the entire family and dinner is done in a few clicks. Also yesterday was our first virtual classroom with the education department. If you missed out on that, we're doing it every Thursday. It's $3 for members, $5 for non-members. And you can check out all the details, the themes, and the dates at ToledoZoo.org. All right, we had one more idea for you guys that Catherine in our development department gave to us. A lot of us are ordering supplies through Amazon right now as we're practicing proper social distancing and maybe not heading out to the grocery stores and stuff. So if you're buying things on Amazon, be sure that you've marked Toledo Zoo as your Amazon Smile charity beneficiary. It's just one more way you can help us and every little bit helps to sustain our future. Once again, you'll notice the donate button at the bottom. We also have our Facebook fundraiser and ToledoZoo.org slash donate if you're looking for ways you can help us during this difficult time. We sincerely appreciate all of you tuning in and helping us through this time, and we hope that this is a cool way to stay connected to you. We're going to turn it over now to Jay, our aquarium curator, and he's going to talk to us about the old aquarium, this new aquarium, and all the cool things that live in here. Well, good morning, everyone. I can't believe it's been five years since we reopened this building. Uh, the actual project to renovate the aquarium took a five-year period before that. So it's been 10 years of my 30 years here at the zoo has been uh, involved with the aquarium renovation one way or another. Where we're standing right now, for you uh, older folk, may remember the walkthrough rainforest exhibit. It was, uh, there was a wooden pathway with some artificial trees and birds flying around and a little stream. Um, that's where we're standing right now. That went away. Um, it was a, a smallish rainforest 
And um, we think that these two larger tanks, which by the way, this is the Gulf of Mexico exhibit. We want to get a shot of this. They're actually feeding the tank right now. What perfect timing. Good timing, us. huh? <laughs> this is uh, something that my staff was doing as part of their regular day-to-day -day work. And I didn't realize they're going to be in here. There's a bonnethead shark, which is a small hammerhead shark. And it's feeding on, uh, looks like capelin and smelt pieces right now. This tank holds about 30,000 gallons of water. And what other creatures are in here besides the bonnet head? Well, we've got um, a couple different species of stingray. There's a large tarpon, a big silver game fish up here at the top. And these silver, smaller silver fish swimming very fast are called bar jack. Now, one animal in here is not so visible right now because, again, we're doing some work on this tank. That's Tink the sea turtle. If you look up in this upper right corner here, there's a black object. And what that is, is a mesh net. And if you look very carefully, you might be able to see Tink moving around in there. What we do is this. Tink came to us uh, about six months before we opened. Tink was a sea turtle that got hit by a boat out in the ocean and can't survive on its own. It floats in the water. The damage from getting hit by the boat causes it to be too buoyant. It floats like a cork. And so if you put it out in the ocean, it can't dive down and find food. What we've done is we've brought it into captivity and we've attached weights to its shell, which allow it to swim normally. People say, well, with the weights on, can you put it back in the ocean? Well, the weights fall off about every four months. So we reattach the weights as needed. So here's the, the, the thing that's going on right now. <clears throat> Tink loves to eat. It loves shrimp and squid and smelt. And it's, uh, its favorite thing to do is just chow down. We have to feed all the fish in this tank like you just saw. There's some more food coming in at the top up there. If Tink was swimming around, Tink would be getting more than his fair share of the food. Tink was going to become overweight. So what we did was we trained Tink to swim into that basket at feeding time. Tink is being fed romaine lettuce leaves right now. <laughs> Tink doesn't know anything any better. He doesn't realize that there's better food out here in the tank it can't see that high calorie food that's being fed to the other fish. Tink is very happy sitting in its basket eating romaine lettuce. Then when the feed winds down, we let Tink out, Tink swims around, and we give Tink some regular food too. But that way we've been able to lower his weight gain and keep him trim and, and healthy. Um, and Tink's none the wiser. Very nice. And Tink is one of the fan favorites here at the zoo. And Jay and I were talking before we went live with you guys. I will be here five years in just a couple of weeks. And when I came and started, Tink was much smaller. Talk about how much Tink has grown. Well, more than doubled in size. Um, maybe not in length, but in, in weight. So Tink came here and I'm thinking a weighed about 30 pounds. Tink came in a container that was about this big, like that and like that. It was shipped here um, by FedEx. They donated the, the transport of Tink along with a caretaker from the Florida Keys where Tink had been kept before this. Um, now Tink is shells about that big and weighs about 105 pounds. So in five years, Tink has really grown. And we're just uh, monitoring its diet and keeping it um, a little bit moderated so we can slow that growth down because the turtles will grow based on their food availability. And what we're doing is ensuring that Tink's growth is the same as it would be in the wild, not like it could be in captivity if you just fed it as much as it wanted to eat. Sure. Uh, Brinley has a question. How many fish are, and creatures are in this tank? Well, let's pan the camera and you all count real quick, okay? <laughs> That's my way of saying, I don't know. There are, I, I mean, we know Tink, we know the Tarpon, there are four bonnethead sharks, the big spotted eagle ray going across the front there. There is a southern stingray along the bottom. It's a big brown ray. And the ones that I don't know the exact numbers on 
are the bar jack, the little silverfish. So I'm gonna count them real fast. <laughs> All right, let's give it a, see if you get the same number as Jay gets, guys. 21, 22, I count 22 bar jack. All right, we'll see. And I think there's six cow nose rays. They're the smaller brown ones. No, I'm sorry, there's eight. All right. Um, so we have a computer system that all these animals are in the inventory system, and I can look up on a computer and tell you exact numbers at any point, but I may not have them memorized. <laughs> Understood. There's an awful lot of fish in here. So in the entire aquarium, what's your ballpark figure of how many sea creatures you have? There's about 2,500 animals, 2,500 animals in the building. All right. We're gonna move on here. We're gonna move for now just one tank over and you can tell us about these giant fish that we're looking at here, Jay. This, this is our South American flooded forest exhibit. What happens in South America around the Amazon River Basin is that um, there's a rainy season and a dry season. Rainy season is really rainy. We're talking potentially water depths flooding out into the forest of 20 or 30 feet depth, whereas during the dry season it would be dry ground. Wow. So the fish actually swim out into the forests to find food like fruit and, and other things. And one of the fish is this giant arapaima, and those can grow maybe twice that size. Wow. And um, they would swim out into the flooded forest and then during the dry season the waters recede back to the regular riverbed and the arapaima would move back. That is unreal. Um, Kenzie and Samuel want to know, what's your favorite fish? Ah, well, I've got a lot of different favorites. It depends on um, just my mood and, and how I'm, and the, the, my favorite animal is the new animal that I've never worked with before. So if we get something new that I've never seen before or never held in the aquarium, and I have to learn all about it, to me that's the most interesting, it makes it most interesting at that point. Then after I've learned how to care for it, okay, now it's just run of the mill and it's not as interesting. Overall, um, day in and day out though, my favorite fish is the flashlight fish. I really like those. However, folks, the flashlight fish, we moved all to the basement right now because we're taking the time that the zoo is closed to work on their exhibit and make it better. Um, but to do that, we had to take the water out, and so the fish obviously had to come out also. And um, so we won't be able to see flashlight fish today, but those, if you were to ask my, my uh, favorite of all time, that would be them. All right, and just so you guys know, the flashlight fish, we'll show you where that exhibit would be as we tour through the zoo. And I guess it's a great reason to have to come back and talk to you guys again. So we're gonna step on up into the touch tank area of the aquarium. And when you come up this ramp, to your left we have the moon jelly exhibit, which changes colors and you guys can press the buttons to change the different colors of the water. And then we have our ocean lab, which has smaller creatures for visitors to be able to touch and hold and it's run by our education department and then as we move around here talk to us about this kelp forest well we wanted to make the new aquarium a lot more fun and a lot more interactive for kids um, and people of all ages i guess so this is just artificial kelp that kids can walk through to pretend like they're in a kelp forest going to our kelp exhibit right here. And besides kelp, what are these giant crabs over here, mm -hmm. Jay? Yeah, these are giant Japanese spider crabs. How We've, big do they get? Well, My they can goodness. get about twice that size. And they, uh, they don't move a lot. They're not moving right now. They're all just sort of sitting on the bottom. But when we put food in there, they get up on their legs and, and we'll go after the food. Um, and it's just uh, one of those interesting things that we're able to um, showcase here. Um, they come to us from Japan and they're difficult to acquire. As you might imagine, they have to come from a, a 
they're actually from a seafood market in Japan. That they, they would eat these like, like king crab legs or something. And these, uh, instead of being eaten, were shipped to us. And we've had them on exhibit, well, since we opened. We actually had a few giant crab even in the old aquarium. People may remember that in a much, much smaller tank. We were doing that um, as a, uh, a way to um, practice and learn about giant crabs, knowing that we were going to have a large giant crab exhibit. We wanted to get some in back in the old aquarium just to make sure we knew how to care for them. And we did, and, and uh, these have been doing really well. Wonderful. And then when we come out of this kelp forest, we have our touch tank, which obviously without you guys here to enjoy it, um, they have some of the cover still on, but you can see some of the animals are still swimming around in there. And normally this is where you guys would be able to wash your hands and then be able to put your hands down into the water and touch these different rays and horseshoe crabs. What else is in here, Jay? There's epaulette sharks and uh, the uh, cow nose ray. You can tell they're splashing and swimming around. Uh, you know, you might say, oh, wow, they must miss people. And they might to some extent, but they're, what they're really missing is they're waiting for the, to be fed. I bet, um, yes. But uh, it's, it's funny, we, we, don't, we don't recognize fish as having personalities, but they are definitely reacting to us standing here. They know we're here. Now, whether they're just waiting to feed, get fed, or whether they actually want to interact with people, I cannot say. Sure. Um, if you noticed at the top, though, we did find a different use for uh, yoga balls. Yes. Yeah, so the yoga <laughs> balls are floating here. This is a fine mesh bird net that we cover the exhibit whenever there's not a staff person here. So when the touch tank is open to the public, we have someone standing here. Just in case a fish were to jump out, um, they can then put it right back in and it's not harmed. When we don't have someone standing here, we have to cover it, and we didn't want the net to sit down into the water, so we found these three yoga balls, and that just holds the net up off the water. Very nice. And Tony asks, what's your favorite part of being a zookeeper or curator? Well, let me think for a second. I mean, the, the common answer would be, you know, working with the animals. Um, but I don't work with the animals directly that much anymore. I work mainly with people um, and people that work with animals. And I found um, that that's actually pretty interesting. Um, I work with a great staff here who can uh, take care of all these wonderful animals and I just work with them. We acquire, one of, the, one of the things that a curator does is something called a collection plan. And that's just a term for what animals do you get for exhibit? You have to get animals that the public wants to see, that you can care for properly, um, that might have conservation need. And so those are all the sorts of things a curator does is sit down and review those animals and decide what to bring into the collection, bring into the Toledo Zoo. And that's really interesting too. And how many staff work for you here in the aquarium, Jay? There are six aquarists and myself. Very nice. And we are moving on here to the Pacific Reef Tank, which is our biggest tank here in the new aquarium. Talk to us about this one, Jay. So this tank is about 35 feet across, about 12 feet deep, and holds 90,000 gallons of uh, tropical salt water. There are four black tip reef sharks in here, one large zebra shark, and a couple small epaulette sharks, as well as probably 200 smaller fish. And now this is where we have live dives too. That's right. We have a diver that goes into the tank at, at, at uh, scheduled times to feed the fish and talk to the visitors through a microphone in their face mask. We can give uh, information about conservation. We can talk about the fish their diver is seeing. And then of course, people just like to see the fish eat. Um, we feed the black tip reef sharks at a separate time and not by divers. So the black tip reef sharks do not associate a person in the water with food, which is probably a good thing. Yes. <laughs> uh, Bree asks, how do you feed the fish that have different species in the tank like this one? Mm -hmm. That can be pretty tricky. You have to have a variety of food, a variety of sizes, and then you have to feed where the food is spaced out. You can't just put the food just in one location because then they, they, they tend to compete for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so this is what's called being fed 
at liberty where we just um, you just put the food in and let the fish pick what they want to eat usually works okay <clears throat> but think about a small child given a choice okay do you want to eat your Brussels sprouts or would you like this uh, birthday cake mm -hmm. that can be a problem so we have to make sure the diets are, are uh, proper in all respects absolutely and <coughs> Let's see. Wyatt would like to know how large the biggest shark in this tank is. Well, that's the zebra shark right up here, right in the middle of the tank. And you might ask the first question, you might say, um, well, uh, that shark has spots, not stripes. Why is it called a zebra shark? <clears throat> well, in Australia, that species is called a leopard shark. Leopards have spots, makes a lot more sense. For whatever reason, in the United States, when these sharks are babies, they're black and white striped. Then they lose their stripes and they become spotted. In the United States, we named them after their juvenile color pattern. But that's the largest shark we have. It's hard to estimate, but I would say it's about, um, about almost six feet long. Wow. <coughs> and Illyria's Franklin Elementary asks, do the sharks eat the fish in the tank? So, once in a great while, um, we can't avoid that. That's nature. Um, they would certainly be eating a lot more fish in the wild. But, like I said, we have the black tip reef sharks. Um, they are accustomed to feed, being fed prepared food from the surface. It's too much work to chase these small fish around. Um, so they, they, once in a great while, they'll catch one, you know, catch one that's not paying attention. Um, but one thing that we do is... <clears throat> It's hard to explain, but over many years of people keeping sharks mixed with other fish, we know what fish will live well with sharks and what ones won't. Some fish are smarter than others, <laughs> so we put the smart ones in here. This is the smart fish tank. I, I like that. I like and the zebra shark, I should say, even though it's the largest shark in the tank, its mouth is actually much smaller than the black tip reef sharks. It doesn't feed on anything larger than about... Uh, four inches and it's so slow it can't chase any of the fish. So it's the black tip reef sharks that would be the top predator in this tank. All right, and I'm going back here because I know I missed a question that dovetails perfectly to that one. Let's see here. Oh yes, Emerson asks, what is the smallest fish you have and the biggest fish we have okay. in the aquarium? Again, I'm gonna have to think for a little bit. <laughs> um, because here's the trick. When you say the biggest fish, do you mean the heaviest or the longest? Oh, let's see. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in for Emerson here. Tell us about the longest one first. Okay. I would say that the longest fish is probably the arapaima that we saw. The biggest fish weight-wise is uh, not counting tink, because tink's not a fish. Not it's a, a fish. turtle. Yes. Would be that zebra shark up there. All right. Now, how about smallest. your smallest? So, I just saw the smallest fish in this tank. It just swam by. Um, it's a little butterfly fish. If it comes by again, I'll point it out. Okay. Um, it's, about, it's about three inches long. The smallest fish in the whole aquarium is a tetra. There, there's the smallest fish in this tank, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Good, quick reaction And there it's also <laughs> one of the most expensive. That's a very rare fish. Um, very expensive little butterfly fish from the Pacific Ocean. Um, the smallest fish overall are some little tetras. We, we walk past their tank over here, um, and they are about three quarters of an inch long. All right. Now, we are about to make the bend into what you guys refer to as the West Hall. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, but tell us, if we were in the old aquarium, where would we be right now, Jay? Cause we're for so, so you guys can get your bearings. We are in between the <clears throat> Pacific Reef tank and the flashlight fish right. exhibit, which Jay mentioned earlier. So, my old office was uh, the flashlight fish exhibit. So this would be outside my old office. It would be right behind the uh, old giant Japanese crab exhibit. Okay. So, that's right. kind of where we are. It's hard to orient yourself with everything that got changed so much. It's not 
you know, the walls are gone. It's hard to visualize exactly where we are. Absolutely, and just um, so that we don't miss anything, we did pass the schooling fish exhibit, which mm -hmm. is quite fun, and the jewel tanks along that far wall. Talk to us a little bit about what those are for. Well, the jewel tanks are kind of as their name implies, little aquatic jewels, small items, small fish, like the tetra that I mentioned, that really can't survive well with all these other large predatory fish. So we have ways to exhibit these smaller fish or specialized feeders, like seahorses. We have some seahorses over there. Seahorses are so slow when it comes to feeding that they get outcompeted by everything. And they need to be kept in a tank by themselves or they just won't get enough food. We also have the clownfish and sea anemone, Nemo. Um, and those do best in a tank with just the clownfish and just the anemones. Absolutely, and most of you guys know clownfish from Finding Nemo, and those were very big when we first opened this aquarium, mm -hmm. right, Jay? Yep. All right, we are moving around this giant Pacific Reef tank, and this is our Reflections Gallery. It is a community art gallery that um, changes every few months and features art from our local region. And so when we have our Wild About Art, the winners get displayed in here and a lot of community organizations also help us out to fill this, um, this area. And then here we are with the sea jellies. Talk to us about these that are above us and the ones that we're gonna look at right over sure. here. Well, these are, again, to make the, the basic aquarium not just all about fish, you know? We wanna incorporate art and culture uh, and a lot of variety into uh, the aquarium. For instance, it's not playing now, but when we're open to the public, we have music that comes through to give a, a feeling as you go through the aquarium of, of being underwater. And so this, this glass art up here is just another factor um, that we've done to uh, just liven things up and, and give people more than just the fish to see. Very nice. And I will say, I could sit on this bench in front of these sea nettles for the longest time. Talk to us about these amazing creatures. Well, sea nettles are a type of invertebrate, so they don't have a backbone, they don't have a brain, they don't have uh, eyes. They um, have to be kept in a special tank where the water circulates in a, um, a very slow uh, counterclockwise fashion. So in this case, it would be um, from right to left and then down and then up the right side and across the top. And that's how the, they, they, they don't have eyes so they can't tell what direction they're swimming. If they don't have good water currents, they would just pile up on the bottom. And I'll tell you right now, the overhead lights on this exhibit are turned off. Jellyfish or Pacific sea nettles don't know that. They really don't have good light receptors. They don't know night from day, but we have the lights turned off for a reason. Um, we're not open to the public, so the people aren't necessarily here to see the Pacific sea nettles, but when we have the lights on, it grows a microorganism called algae. It's kind of like a plant, but it's a, it's a photosynthetic uh, organism that grows on the windows and the backs of all our exhibits if they're given light. And with the aquarium closed, having the lights on just grows algae, which means we just have to clean it. And so in order to let the staff have time to do other work, we're cutting back on the light so we don't have as much algae. And Bryn asks, how long can the tentacles get? Depends on the species. These tend to grow tentacles that are about, about twice as long as you might see here. That's about as long as they'll grow. The moon jellies that we walked past earlier have tentacles that are maybe a half inch long. Then there is an animal called the Portuguese man of war. Mm -hmm. Now, it looks like a jellyfish. It's not a jellyfish, but it has long tentacles. And those tentacles can be like 100 feet long. Wow. So that's, if you're down in Florida um, and you see a Portuguese man of war going by, it has to be more than 100 feet away from you because you could still get stung by it. Oh my goodness. And Roan wants to know, do these ever get tangled up? Yes, yep, they do. And um, we get them in, these were raised, this batch was raised by the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. When we got them, they were the size of a quarter and they've grown quite a bit. And what we do is as they grow, um, we, we have to thin the herd, so to speak. 
And what we'll do is we'll take some of these adults and we take them to another aquarium here in Ohio and they put them in their exhibit. And that helps us um, keep the numbers down. As, so as these get bigger, we move some of them out. And Wyatt asks if the squishy part stings too. No, <laughs> you, can, you could reach your hand and touch the bell, that's the, the, the round part, and not get stung. Um, if you put your hand on the other side, then yes, you would feel it. Now this species doesn't sting really strongly. If it touches the inside of your arm, um, you'll definitely feel it, but if you have calluses on your fingers, you won't feel it on your fingers. And Ashlyn and Trenton want to know, how do you keep the tanks clean? You talked about the algae and having to clean them. How do you keep them clean? Okay, so the algae has to be removed by scrubbing, <laughs> wiping it off as it grows. Um, algae's not bad. It doesn't hurt the animals at all. It just, if it grows on the front glass, though, the visitors can't see it. Sure. So we have to keep the algae to a minimum. What truly needs to be clean in these tanks is the water. And so what we have is the basement filled with filters and what we call life support equipment. This is the equipment to keep the proper temperature, salt level, and clarity of the water in all the exhibits by having different filters and equipment down there. And then as the water is lived in by the animals, it has to be changed every once in a while. Just like you would if you had a home aquarium. Change the water every two weeks, 25% of the water. That's kind of what we do here. Very nice. And as tranquil as this is, guys, and as much as I could stay right here all day, we're going to move on so that we can get you to see a little bit more. And I'm seeing quite a few questions about the flashlight fish. And yes, Jay mentioned they are definitely his favorite. Unfortunately, they are off exhibit right now because they are updating that exhibit. So no, guys, unfortunately, we can't see the flashlight fish this time, but it just gives us a reason to have to come back, right? So now tell us, what are we looking at in this tank, Jay? So when we were at the big 90,000 gallon tank a few minutes ago, you saw all the uh, things growing on the rocks in there. All the, well, that's actually artificial. Those are plastic coral. Um, these are live coral. We have live coral in the smaller tanks because live coral is really, really delicate. Um, fish, big fish would bump into it and break it. It needs a lot of light in order to stay alive um, because it actually has algae that I talked about that lives inside the coral animal. And that's called a symbiotic relationship where the algae and the coral need to live together. And so the algae utilizes light and it produces food for itself, but also excess food goes to the coral and the coral uses that as food. So we, we have such critical conditions to keep this coral alive, we have to put them in special tanks by themselves. Also, a lot of fish eat live coral. So the fish that we have in this exhibit are ones that don't eat live coral. Very nice. And I will say coral reefs have been in the news lately um, with climate change and bleaching. Talk to us about why it's important to show off coral. Well, um, I should point out, because um, this is really important, the coral that you see here was all grown here at the Toledo Zoo or at other aquariums. It didn't come from the ocean. Uh, we don't want, you know, a small, a few small pieces of coral like this taken from the ocean really won't hurt anything, but we want to set a good example. Absolutely. So we grow our own coral in tanks in our basement. Uh, we send coral out to other aquariums and other aquariums send coral to us. Coral is an animal but it grows like a plant. And you can actually take and break off pieces of coral and grow new coral colonies from those broken pieces, and that's what we do. So it's important to showcase so that people can see what a living coral reef looks like and to understand that we need to protect coral reefs in nature because they really are being hard hit. When you hear about coral bleaching, that means the coral has turned clear that's what happens when it loses its algae from its tissue. Um, and that happens when the water gets too warm, the algae is released by the coral in a desperate uh, attempt to stay alive. But when it does that, now the coral doesn't have a way to get food. And it, it basically, over if it doesn't get the algae growing back, it will die. Very nice. So 
That is one of the many ways we are working to conserve the world beneath the waves is that we're growing our own and not taking it out of nature. We're going to move on here, guys. Um, let's head over this way. I know Jay mentioned um, this is one of his favorites, uh, fan favorites here in the zoo. Talk to us about this fish. Yeah, so this fish uh, has a long story. It's the only fish in the aquarium that routinely reacts with and interacts with visitors. Most of the other fish, they see people all day long and they just ignore us. Um, in fact, I can't think of any other fish that reacts like this one does. This one comes right up to the glass and it wants to know what's going on. <laughs> and it's a giant garami. It came to the Toledo Zoo in 1992, maybe 1993. Um, it was donated to us by a woman up in Detroit, Michigan, who had kept it for many years, so at least 10 years, and she could no longer take care of it. It was outgrowing her tank, so she called me up one day and asked if I would take it, and I said, sure, okay, and I, she actually brought it down here, and it's, it's been on exhibit ever since. We don't know how long they can live. Um, it's well beyond the estimated uh, longevity of these animals in the wild by double. Um, and, uh, but it still, still looks good and, and still reacts to people. Wow. And so Amanda, uh, basically it's pushing probably 40 years. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we're going to move on down this way. To our right is the Gulf of Mexico tank with Tink. And if you guys want to get a view of Tink, because we didn't get to see Tink the last time we were here, we'll get you that. And they asked earlier, Jay, how big will Tink get? That's difficult to say. Um, sea turtles tend to grow based on their diet and food availability. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, um, I would hope that Tink will maximize weight here at about 300 pounds, but I believe, I don't have my computer open in front of me, but I believe <laughs> they can reach over 500 pounds. Wow, that's amazing. All right, and then we're gonna finish up down here with the Lake Erie exhibit. Talk to us about these fish that we may see if we're out on the lake. Well, these aren't the prettiest fish in the aquarium. <laughs> Some of them would be considered kind of drab or even ugly, but they're important. They're our fish. They're the fish that we have in Ohio and Lake Erie. And um, this is an idea that we have these animals here to be able to show visitors, younger visitors, you know, if you wanted to go fishing, this is what you might see out in Lake Erie. Um, we find that people that do go fishing will come in here and say, oh, I caught one bigger than that, or, or more often, whoa, that's a lot bigger than one I ever caught. So it's it just neat to be able to show those animals. The other fish that are in there, the one that's on the camera right now, is a lake sturgeon. And lake sturgeon have a unique story here at the Toledo Zoo. They are a state endangered species, but the Toledo Zoo has a uh, very, very strong program to every year we get uh, hatchery produce lake sturgeon eggs, so they don't come from the wild, they come from a hatchery. We hatch those eggs out and raise them in Maumee River water, and then in the fall we release them. And this is a what's called restocking. And the idea is, is that now that Lake Erie is, uh, and, and the Maumee River specifically, is a better environment, we think that we can bring, help bring uh, lake sturgeon back to the Maumee River and Lake Erie. And we're, it's a neat project because we partner with a lot of other agencies around the state. We all work together. And if you guys would like to learn more about that, go back in our timeline. We actually were at the, at the Sturgeon Touch Tank in the museum with Dr. Matt Cross a few days ago. And so you can learn more about that there. And we are going to finish up in here, guys, but I, I do know this has been a a burning question people have had for us about Tink. Have you found out if Tink is a boy or a girl yet? Not officially. Uh, we, some, some of my staff calls Tink her, and other of my staff call Tink a boy. 
Um, you cannot tell by looking at a turtle from the outside. You have to uh, uh, look at them internally, and we just haven't, uh, haven't done that. Okay, so again, another reason we'll, we will have to come back and tour more of the aquarium. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jay. You're welcome. You guys have had some amazing questions for Jay. And this, as we said, this is the fifth anniversary of the aquarium reopening. If you haven't made it here, absolutely put it on your to-do list when life gets back to a bit of normalcy. Um, and if you have, come back and enjoy it some more. There are new fish being added quite often, new things going on exhibit. And as Jay said, we are closed right now. So they are taking the time to update and make some changes. So we appreciate all of you guys tuning in Remember, there are so many ways to stay connected with us. Tune into our Facebook Live feeds each weekday at 1030. This weekend, we're debuting a new story time and a craft project for you. So check our social feeds for those. And we always are doing virtual classrooms with the education department. We started the Meals on the Go Tuesdays and Thursdays. You need family dinner, we got you covered. So check out ToledoZoo.org for all the ways that we are bringing the zoo open online to you guys during this closure. Thank you so very much, and we'll see you soon.